Uh, Mr. Knox, whenever you're ready. Thank you. If we could have everyone turn on their cameras so we can ensure we have our quorum, please. Thank you. I see Mr. Green, Mr. Jones, Good morning. Mr. Santos. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ms. Greenwood. I think we are ready to start. I'd like to welcome everyone to our August 11th Board of Investments meeting. Just a quick note that the Real Assets Committee meeting will proceed following this board meeting as stated in that agenda. Linda, would you please read any announcements and then call the roll to confirm attendance? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Knox. This meeting is being conducted as a virtual meeting, so I will do a roll call of the trustees to confirm attendance. Mr. Green? Here. Thank you. Mr. Santos? Mr. Here. Santos, thank Here. you. Mr. Kehoe? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Greenwood? I'm here. Thank Good you. Morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Jones? Here. Thank you. Mr. Bernstein? Here. Mr. Kelly? Present. Ms. Sanchez? Here. Chair Knox? I am here. Okay. Um, staff participating in the meeting include the following, CIO John Grable, CEO Santos Craman, Deputy CEO Louis Lugo, Chief Counsel Stephen Rice, AEO JJ Popovich, Interim CFO Ted Granger, HR Division Manager Carly Natoya, Senior Staff Counsel Michael Herrera, Legislative Star Sta Staff Counsel, I'm sorry, Legislative Affairs Officer Barry Liu, Investment Staff include Jude Perez, Chris Wagner, Scott Drazer, Esmeralda Del Boss, David Chu, Didi Acevedo, Cheryl Liu, Derek Kong, Kwok Wen, Magdalena Armstrong, and Tara Elijah. Consultants participating in the meeting are the investment and in Makita Investment Group, Stepstone, and Alborn. Trustees, please use the Zoom chat option to be placed in the queue. At this time, we, may, we ask all the meeting participants to mute their mics until they're ready to speak, and we may proceed with the agenda. Thank you, Linda. First item up for approval is the minutes for the meeting of July 14th, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved, David. So moved by Mr. Green. Second. Second by Mr. Kelly. Any okay. discussion? Thank you, Linda, please call the roll. Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. Santos? Aye. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Ms. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Abstain. Okay. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Okay. Chair Knox? Aye. Okay. The motion passes. Item number three, report on closed session items. Uh, the report from last meeting was published and is available on lacera.com. Unless anyone has any questions, we are moving on to item four, public comment. Linda did share one public comment via email with us in advance, and I would just ask all the trustees to please review that. And then I understand we have several people waiting to address us this morning, Linda, and if you could call them one by one, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the first person we're gonna call on is Ms. Jan Williams. Ms. Jan, please start, enter star six to unmute yourself. Ms. Sanchez? Hold on, I have to turn down the live stream. Can you hear me now? Yes, and you will have three minutes to address the board. Good morning, Lucera board members. I hope you all are well and staying safe during this uh, horrendous COVID pandemic we've all been going through for far too long. My name is Jan Williams. I'm a board member of Downtown Crenshaw Rising. And I first would like to ask you to please cancel your contract with DWS Deutsche Bank, who you have given control um, of the sale of the Crenshaw Mall to. DWS Deutsche Bank is doing a whole lot of dirty deals. And as you guys have seen over the last nearly uh, over a year, they have not been able to raise the money to close the sale on any bill. We have submitted the highest bid um, and they refused it. They are not good fiscal partners at all. And you are doing a disservice to your members who are living in the community in the downtown Crenshaw area who will be pushed out 
if they close, if they, if they, um, because they continue to want to put these gentrifying projects in our neighborhoods, you need to tell DWS Deutsche Bank there are plenty of other deals that they can go find, but we are not going to let them continue to run amok in our community. This guy, David Schwartzman, is a racist, a sexist, and is a violent person that we do not want in our community whatsoever. And we will hope that you will want to do better for your members and allow them to sustain and stabilize their community. You're using the, the money of pension fund holders to push them out of the, of the community that they live in. And that's not cool whatsoever. So what we're asking, what I'm asking you to do is to please cancel your contract with Deutsche Bank. Please consider the sales of the Crenshaw Mall to downtown Crenshaw Rising. We submitted the highest bid and we see that this, this mall, like this sale, is making national and international news. So there are a lot of eyes on this. We, I don't know if y'all want to see lawsuits happening. But it's a lot of dirty deals going on. So please do what you can, which I know you have power, because you gave DWS the power over this sale. Use your influence to cancel that contract with DWS Deutsche Bank and sell them all to the people of Crenshaw. We deserve ownership and control and community wealth building not the continued push out of black people in Los Angeles. We do not want to see a Trump Tower. We do not want to see a skyscraper. We do not want to see $900,000 condos in our community. Our Thank community you, Ms. Jen, your three minutes. Want. Thank you, Ms. Williams, your three minutes is up. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Next speaker, Linda. Next, we will call on Patrice Fisher. Ms. Fisher, can you hear me? Ms. Fisher, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Ms. Fisher, can you hear us? Hello. Good morning, Ms. Fisher. You, you have three minutes to address the board and you may begin now. Okay, hold on. I turn this one down. And just a quick reminder for all of our speakers, just to turn down the, the volume as quickly as you can, just so we can um, bring you up for your comments. Thank you. Good morning, Lucera board members. This is Patrice Fisher. I'm a member of downtown Crenshaw Rising, and I am a community resident for over 34 years. I find it to be insane that I'm here again, questioning your fiduciary duties, your foresight and intelligence as a board. Do you really think anyone believes you have no influence over Deutsche Bank, DWS's selection of the buyer for the Baldwin Hills Plaza Mall? Are you delusional enough to think that this community will accept your complicity in the corrupt process and not hold you accountable if this latest attempt to sell the mall goes through? The records will show you were completely aware of the blatant prejudice and inequities in the bidding process and therefore compliant. Five extensions to David Schwartzman? Really? How many failed closings so far? Three and working on the fourth. And you are putting the same incompetent Deutsche Bank DWS in charge of handling the sale? How far will you go to prevent downtown Crenshaw rising and the community from buying this mall? And in case you've missed the national media coverage this gross injustice is getting, just Google it. it continues to grow. Just know the community will not stop fighting until there is a fair and just conclusion. Thank you, and I hope you finally do what's right for LaSara, its members, and the Crenshaw community. Thank you very much, Ms. Fisher. Next speaker, Linda. And uh, next we will bring in Michael Ginn. 
Mr. Ginn, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Hello, hello. Greetings and salutations. Uh, my name is Michael A. Gwynn, and I'm a member of Lucera as well as Downtown Christian Rising. And uh, again, uh, my reason for being on today is to stress upon the fact that um, this current uh, deal um, that is pending for the Crenshaw Mall needs to be stopped. And I want to not necessarily beg, but try to plead with uh, you today and to find a way to step back, take another look at, 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 at this deal, your fiduciary responsibility, as well as the impact if this deal goes through with the current bidder that you have in place. And as being a member of LACERA, um, it's my duty to make sure that the bylaws and the policies and things in place that regulate investments outside of the uh, LACERA of Hill. Um, this is one of the, the most egregious acts, not on your end, but on how this played out in terms of our bid. We had the best bid, the best structure, and we were financed and still turned down. So at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you to reconsider, speak to whomever you need to speak with on your investment arm to make sure they take another look at this. Because it's just not my, myself, it's others in the community that, that, that continue to take issue with this. Downtown Christian Horizon would not stop until things are made right in the universe. And I thank you today, and I appreciate the time, and I yield back your, your time to others. Appreciate your comments, Mr. Gwynn. Next speaker, Linda. Next, we will bring in Mr. Greg Akili. Mr. Akili, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, I want to call and ask the um, the board why it continues to not accept the uh, the bid of the downtown Crenshaw and why you keep going outside to people outside of our community to extract wealth from our community and not allow us to build. And we keep coming to you with the same. We've done everything that uh, that has been asked, and yet we still cannot get our bid accepted. We are left with no conclusion, no, except that this is a racist board uh, and that you are anti-Black. Accept our bid, and let's move forward. Um, thank you. Next, we will thank you, Mr. Achille. Next speaker, Linda. Th next, we will call on Kim Isaacs. Kim, please enter star six to unmute yourself. I have unmuted myself. We can hear you. Am please, I to uh, begin now? when you're ready. Okay. Um, I'm calling you because I just wanted to understand why we are uh, downtown Crenshaw rising is not being allowed to purchase the mall. We have the highest bid and instead of allowing us to buy it, the main, the guy who's now trying to buy it is reckless and competent and he's dangerous to our, our community. We also, I'm really upset. We're just annoyed. It's probably not even a good word, but we're disgusted with the, L-A-C-E-R-A, -E because keep picking unqualified racist white gentrifiers who do not have the money or community support to develop them all. Because without the community support, ain't nobody going there. Can't put somebody, somebody racist and who has a track record of unethical and inhumane practices in, our, in a black community and think that black people are gonna shop there. You can't do it. This man, Schwartzman, is a failed developer 
And he has no interest in protecting the tens of thousands of black people who make Baldwin Hills, Crenshaw, the district and thriving commerce center it is today. He would rather replace people with a million dollar condos so gentrification can remake the racial makeup of our community because black people will not be able to afford the condos that they're going to put up. We won't be able to afford it. And so it's going to then bring in white people. And then all of a sudden, the culture of our community that we have created for so many years is going to go away. We have a community and we take care of each other. And we want this mall. We deserve to have this mall. We have the money to have this mall. Yet no one is going to sell it to us. And I need for you to understand that this is, we are just going to run away this buyer the same way we run away the last two. When, he, they, when they recognize the community does, does not want them there, they're not going to stay because that means all we're going to do is boycott it. All we're going to do is protest outside of it. That's all we're going to do. And they're going to ultimately have to leave because there is no reason to not allow us to buy the ball when we have the money. This man has shown disgusting attitudes towards women and Black people when he said, I hope she gets raped by 10 black men in South Central in referring to a, an opposing attorney who was a woman. This, among other problematic tendencies, shows he is very unsafe and unfit to develop anything in our community. Why does Lucera continue to ignore the legitimacy of our far more competitive bid? Why does our unapologetic blackness seem to bother you so much when it comes to transforming our community? Our black, we're already there. The blackness is already there. Why are you trying to remove us from our own community by putting in a buyer who has a, less money than we have and who is a racist, sexist person? Thank you, Ms. Why? Isaacs. Your three minutes is up. Thank you. And next, we will call on uh, Donald Byers. Mr. Byers, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Mr. Byers, can you hear me? Mr. Byers, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Okay, we'll come back to Mr. Byers. We'll go move on to Ms. Tamara Casa. Ms. Casa, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Tamar, can you hear us? Tamar, can you hear me? Please yes, ma'am. Perfect. Okay, you may begin now. You have three minutes to address the board. Um, good day. Uh, I wanna say that Schwarzman is failed developer who has a known track record of using unethical and unhumane un un practices that leave tenants no other option than to be wrongly evicted from their apartments. Uh, Schwarzman has no interest in protecting the tens of thousands of black people who make the BH Crenshaw the historic and thriving commerce center it is today. Uh, he would rather replace the people with million, million dollar condos so gentrification can remake the racial makeup of our community. Um, he has demonstrated disgusting attitudes towards women and black people when he has said, I hope she gets raped by 10 black men in South Central in regards to a female opposing attorney. Um, this, among his other problematic tendencies, shows he is very unsafe and unfit to redevelop anything in our community. Um, lastly, why does Lacerra continue to ignore legitimacy, legitimacy of DCR, um, DCR's far more competitive bid? Um, why does our unapologetic blackness seem to bother you so much when it comes to transforming our community? VCR and its tens of thousands of supporters will not stand for it. We will drive out HDG just like we drove out CIM and LiveWork. Um, it's unconscionable to think that uh, 
any that Lacera would um, back Deutsche Bank and any bidder that would want to push out the black community, um, folks that have lived in the community over 60 years. Um, you know, we need we need support from the community. Um, they have put in the bid even before David Schwartzman, um, a substantial bid at that. And um, it's been deliberately blocked by uh, Deutsche Bank, which sits, uh, the board sits of uh, 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 all white male board, um, is deliberately blocking the sale to the black community. Um, this is, you know, unacceptable. Um, it's a deliberate move. Um, they put in a substantial bid long before David Schwartzman. Um, they've given David Schwartzman an extension even, and he has a Russian crony, Len Blanovic, excuse me if I pronounce his name wrong, um, is a Russian crony. Um, what does Russia have to do with the Crenshaw district? I believe they don't have the people's interest, best interest in mind. So we're asking that, um, you know, we need support. Um, and that you do not allow the sale to uh, racist gentrifiers um, and support downtown Crenshaw that has the community's best interest in mind. And uh, that completes my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments this morning. Next speaker, Linda. Next, we will bring in Jason Reedy. Jason, please enter star six to unmute yourself and you will have three minutes to address the board. Hello. Good morning, how are you? I'm not doing too well. Uh, my name is Jason Reedy and I'm a proud member of downtown Crenshaw. First of all, I'm, I'm appalled that y'all keep picking, picking racist white gentrifiers to develop the Baldwin Crenshaw Mall while you continue to ignore the bid of downtown Crenshaw Rising. Despite downtown Crenshaw Rising submitting the highest offer of 115 million with the best terms, and expressing a willingness to outbid any outside bidder. Uh, so why don't y'all want to sell us them all? Uh, the latest Gooey Schwartzman and Heritage Development Group have a troubling history of engaging in corrupt business practices, violating the rights of tenants, and displacing communities of color. Schwartzman doesn't belong anywhere near the Crenshaw Mall or any black community, so why are y'all pulling out the red carpet for him? This man said the following to a female opposing attorney, we've already heard others say it, I hope she gets raped by 10 black men in South Central. What if that was you, Gina Sanchez? What if that was you, Elizabeth Greenwood? What if that was you, Esmeralda Del Bosque? We know that DWS has carried out this whole process in a racially discriminatory manner. And guess what? There's more eyes on this than ever. Um, so the ball is in your court. The people are what make Baldwin Hills and Crenshaw the place that it is. And bringing in this racist means that they will be displaced you will forever be tied to these partners and you will face the consequences of enacting this violence against our community. Like Auntie Jan said earlier, you have members that live in this community that will be pushed out as a result of this. Do you care about them? Anyone looking at the facts? And yes, these are the facts. We'll see that you are anti-Black. They'll see your complicitness in uprooting our elders and generations of families in this community. And you will solidify yourselves as the racist that you are. And there ain't no coming back from that. Patrick Jones, you gonna rise for your people? We ain't just the type of people that talk the talk, we walk the walk, ask CIM about us, ask Live Work about us. I mean, just a few weeks back, we was protesting coast to coast. This ain't a game for us. This is our future. We fighting for our babies. We organize, we stay ready, and we will not rest until our community and our mall is in our hands. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Reedy. Next speaker, Linda. Next. Uh, we will call on Magic Collins. Mr. Collins, you will have th um, three minutes to address the board. Please enter star six to unmute yourself. Good evening. My name is Magic Collins. I'm a member of downtown Crenshaw. I was gonna say crony capitalism is used a lot in our political world, unfortunately, because it what governs most of our democracy. Uh, and Deutsche Bank has practiced nothing but this practice as they've gone above and beyond to make sure David Schwartzman gets this mall by giving extension after extension. 
choosing for-profit developers over people. In his own statement from an interview, he talked about usual suspects. Much like the character in the movie, he is in it for the hit. From his own words, from his own mouth, he said he's in it for the hit. Like it's a drug to him. The community doesn't need another developer in it for the hit. His project is threatening to displace over 38,000 residents. This is human life. Community-owned development is not only important for Crenshaw, it's critical to the homeless crisis in LA County as a whole. This project will act as a stabilizer to everything this community has gone through in the past and is currently going through as we move past this pandemic. No further comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Next speaker, Linda. Next, we will call on Ms. Eliza Franklin. Ms. Franklin, uh, please enter star six to unmute yourself and you will have three minutes to address the board. Ms. Franklin, can you hear us? Ms. Uh, Eliza oh. Franklin, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you will, you will have three minutes to address the board and you may begin now. Okay. Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to address the last of the board. And I want to take this time to introduce myself. My name is Eliza. Franklin Edmerson and the legislation and the struggles that follow. My name is Eliza Franklin Edmerson and I'm currently a UCLA urban planning student, master's of urban planning student. And foremost, I'm a concerned community woman. I'm here to speak in solidarity with downtown Crenshaw Rising as a resident of South Los Angeles. I have watched over the past few years from my youth into adulthood as the community has transformed, not by choice, but by force. I attended the Universal Beauty of College nestled on 43rd and Lamert Park and it is closed down. I spent several years as a licensed hairstylist afterwards, working on Crenshaw Boulevard and watched as many of the businesses exchanged hands several times and eventually most of the former ones are gone after the railway expansion began. The mall, the Crenshaw Mall, stands as a living testament to our community. The mall itself is more than a building. It is a cultural center that has flourished in spite of the myriad of challenges the surrounding community has endured. A study by the Felix Center of found that money circulates one time, as we all know, or may not know, in the African-American community, six times in the Latino community and nine times in the Asian community. In white neighborhoods, money circulates nearly an unlimited number of times, right? In part, this explains the wealth gap that exists for black communities. With that being said, the question I pose to the last board is in what context does the sale of this mall to an entity which is outside of the community serve? Oftentimes, place and trauma are linked in the same way. And the sale of the mall to the downtown Crenshaw rising, it offers an opportunity for community healing in a place that has experienced scarcity, socioeconomically, politically, and in so many other ways. And the people who are currently attempting to purchase the mall have no real connection, no real community connection. An emphasis needs to be placed on the aspect of dignity. This dignity is not employed through defining it on behalf of the community, 
But thank you, Ms. Franklin. Your three minutes. Thank you, Ms. Franklin. Your three minutes yeah. is up. Next, we will call on Kim Yergen. Kim, you will have three minutes to address the board. Uh, please enter star six to unmute yourself. Kim, can you hear me? Please enter star six to unmute yourself and you will have three minutes to address the board. Ms. Yergin, you, can, you may begin now. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I was trying to get to some information. Um, Kim Yergin. 40 year resident of uh, Crenshaw, uh, South LA. Um, I'm living black for 75 years. I know what racism looks like. Singing, dancing, dunking, running, etc., are activities that white folks like seeing black folks do. But when it comes to black economic empowerment, ownership, self-determination and prosperity, you give us the finger and tell us there's nothing you can do. Well, yes, you can. The Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza is but a small asset in your portfolio that were it sold to the black community would bode well with your fiduciary responsibility and your pensioners. And yes, you can. Stop Deutsche Bank CWS giving the sale of the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza to their racist and corrupt cronies that only seek to rape and um, steal the economic viability of the black community. And yes, you can. Stop ignoring the corruption, discrimination, and racism by DWS in this sales process doing harm to your fiduciary responsibility. And yes, you can rescind the sale of the Baldwin Hills Central Plaza to the corrupt, racist, and failed developer, David Schwartzman of Heritage Development Group, looking to his financier, Lynn Blavatnik, uh, a corrupt Putin crony uh, to finance the sale with his dirty Russian money. And yes, you can do the right thing. Affect a fair and honest sale with downtown Crenshaw who's put together the highest and best youth bid and the money to finance the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza with $34 million in the bank and equity pledges to close the sale now no extensions necessary. Yes, you can award the sale of the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza to downtown Crenshaw on behalf of the people of Crenshaw, South, uh, South Los Angeles. Be on the right side of history. Do the right thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jurgen, for your comments this morning. Linda, next speaker. Uh, next, we will call on Amber Height. Ms. Height. Uh, please enter star six to unmute yourself, and you will have three minutes to um, address the board. Ms. Height, you may begin now. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Please proceed. Yes, thank you. My name is Amber Heights, and I'm a member of Downtown Crenshaw Rising. Um, I'm calling once again um, to discuss the matter of the sale of Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall to David Schwartzman and Harris Development Group. Um, it is becoming very um, ridiculous at this point that we have to keep calling here about our own black self-determination, something that sh should be very obvious. Um, you all are very smart people. I've read your bios online and I am having a hard time realizing why this sale to the black community to uh, downtown Crenshaw is so difficult for you to understand. We have done everything that has been required of us. You keep deflecting over to other entities saying that it is up to them, such as D DWS, to, um, to usher and navigate this bit. However, you select these people. And I refuse to rid you of the responsibility to do right. I refuse to um, give way to the understanding that there's nothing that you can do. You have power and you have influence. And to sit here and to pretend as if you don't is actually very, very wrong of you. And um, it is my hope that you do right. If you're tired of us calling in, guess how tired we are of trying to fight for this mall. Your weariness will not excuse you. And so it is my expectation that you will do right. 
And I look forward to seeing this bid fall into the hands of downtown Crenshaw Rising. Thank you. Appreciate your comments this morning, Ms. Height. Next speaker, Linda. Um, next, we will bring in, uh, we don't have a name for the caller. Um, the caller's phone number is ending in 93. So we'll just go ahead and bring in the caller and they can go ahead and introduce, introduce themselves. Um, caller phone number ending in 93. Please go ahead and enter star six to unmute yourself and you will have three minutes to address the board. Um, can you hear us? Yes, this is Brad Carson. Or Mr. Carson. Yes, we can. Please proceed. Yeah, my name is Brad Carson. And uh, I'm 62 years old, born and raised in uh, Windsor Hills. And I um, am a uh, Baldwin Hills homeowner for the last 35 years. That means 57 years of my life. I've been in walking distance of the... Uh, Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza Mall. With that said, I'm also a member of uh, downtown Crenshaw Rising, but most importantly, uh, I am a Los Angeles County Deputy Probation Officer of 33 years, making me a member of La Sarah. You have my pension funds, and I'm uh, pretty close to retirement. I would like to see my pension funds uh, actually uh, invested into uh, developers and projects like the downtown Crenshaw Rising, uh, where it's community-led, where it's community-organized, where it's have community ownership and the shared prosperity model, which is good for people, which is good for the planet, which is good for profit. Uh, this is the new uh, beginning of a new era coming out of pandemic, coming out of uh, essentially Black Lives Matter uh, marches. Uh, for a uh, for a, a shared prosperity and equity and uh, equal justice for all. So with that said, you know what to do, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, you doing it uh, and getting a return on my investment and seeing the everybody prosper in the community uh, to have a safe neighborhood uh, as well as shared prosperity. Thank you for your time, and I yield the rest of my time to my. Uh, members of the downtown Crenshaw Rising group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Linda, next speaker. So our last speaker, we'll go ahead and bring them in. Their phone number is ending in 7-2. Uh, caller phone number ending in 7-2. Please enter, please enter star six to unmute yourself and you will have three minutes to address the board. Caller phone number ending in 72. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go good morning. Ahead. You can proceed. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Naima Moore, and I have been a Los Angeles resident almost 70 years. Um, my concern is that for so many years, the whole community of Crenshaw has been in a, I would say, low in terms of any type of progress being made based on the construction, based on the lack of support and all those things that are important for a community to thrive. So now we're here talking about the Crenshaw Shopping Center, the Crenshaw Mall, and the black community. Um, I have a lot of passion for the people of the community. I am one of those people. And we feel that the disparity that we've been uh, submitted to for so long is just a continuation, even in this particular situation. Um, if there are people who are capable and able uh, physically, mentally, financially, to uh, allow the people of the community to take ownership and be proud. We've got a Korean town. We've got a, uh, a Hispanic town. We want a Black 
community town, and we want to see it thrive and thrive with the people of the community. So if anyone is listening and can hear what I'm saying, the passion that I feel and uh, the need for our community and our people to see progress and ownership of things that we uh, 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 attend to would be a beautiful thing. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, and hopefully it doesn't go on deaf ears. Appreciate your comments this morning, Ms. Moore, and those of the rest of the speakers. Linda, I believe that concludes public comment and everyone that was signed up. Correct. Thank you very much. We are now on to item five, our chief executive officer's report, Mr. Kreiman. Yes, good morning, Chair Knox and trustees. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll make my comments very brief. Uh, in addition to the items detailed in my written report, I have two additional items that I would like to bring to the trustees' attention. First, um, I wanna let you all know that the election for the third member of the Board of Investments and third member of the Board of Retirement started on August 5th and runs through August 31st. We confirmed this morning with the executive officer for the County of Los Angeles that those active members with the valid email on file received online and telephone voting credentials via email on August 5th. And those members without a valid email on file have received voting credentials via US mail starting last week as well. Uh, the second item uh, is uh, due to the, the rapid spread of the Delta variant and changes in COVID workplace protocols. Uh, we have reevaluated and reconfigured our return to office plans and moved our office reopening from September 13th to October 1st. This will provide us with additional time for staff to prepare and implement a mandatory vaccination plans with limited testing protocols for those staff members that provide medical or religious exemptions. Um, with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. I have Mr. Kelly in the cube just beforehand. I was going to mention that I received the email for the election and I, I thought it worked very well. So um, that's at least one person's opinion of that. Mr. Yes, Kelly? I actually, oh, yeah. go ahead, Mr. Kramer. I'm sorry. I, I actually uh, did not sign up with an email so, to see if I received a, a, a letter and I did get the letter. So um, the mail is also working in addition to the email. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. So I think I was a little bit confused by the written materials um, or, the, or the position in your, um, in your monthly report. Um, so um, in general, I think our staff are public servants and in analyzing a public health policy like this, we need to not forget that they're public servants. They serve active and retired members and I didn't see that position reflected in your report kind of overall. And, um, and I think it needs to be. Um, and where you ended up in the report, I, I think was submitting a questionnaire to all staff to determine if they've been vaccinated. 44 of your 450 staff have responded so far. So there's a huge amount of staff who, have not, who are not participating in this, in this um, information process, which was really disappointing to me. Um, you did not note that that actual questionnaire becomes a, uh, a health document under HIPAA that's subject to HIPAA confidentiality and security protocols. And I think you need to, you need to realize that and focus on that. And then as well, um, I didn't get this weekly testing uh, option because the fact is that if somebody tests on Friday they, and if they're infected on Saturday, um, they'll likely develop symptoms by Tuesday and they're most um, contagious the 24 to 48 hours before they develop symptoms. So you've got a period of several days where these people are potentially in the office, um, infecting other people or in van pools on the way to the office. Um, so that wasn't a reasonable alternative to me in terms of um, limiting, the, uh, limiting the infection among staff and then hence limiting the infection by staff to members. So, um, I think it's. I think it's reserved. I think you were very reserved. Um, there's been a lot of movement towards mandatory vaccination programs, um, and I would just continue to encourage Lucera to evaluate that um, to protect our members. Yeah. So can can I respond? Um, Please. Sure not. So the 44 individuals that reported um, being vaccinated, that was a voluntary uh, notification. 
Um, we just rolled out the mandatory uh, response that we're looking for our staff so that we can determine how many individuals are vaccinated and how many are not. Uh, that will help inform us how we're going to implement our, our plan moving forward. Um, we all uh, appreciate the fact that we're public servants. We talk about that all the time. Um, and so we um, make decisions based on the fact that we understand we, hire, we, we serve our, our members. And that has always been at the forefront in terms of whether they're retirees or active members. We'd like to welcome them back to the, uh, the office uh, so that they can receive the counseling in person if that's what their desire is. Um, in terms of the testing protocols, we are moving in, in mandatory vaccinations. We are moving towards a mandatory vaccination for all staff with the exception of those that have religious or uh, medical uh, conditions. Um, the, 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 the testing will be for those particular individuals that have exemptions. Since we're going to go to mandatory, those individuals that that, will, that do not want to be vaccinated, um, that's something that we're still developing a plan on what we're going to do. We're, we're waiting to see um, what our legal team says. We already know that we do have the authority to ask uh, whether or not our employees are vaccinated or not. Um, the issue is um, what do we do if there's an individual that refuses to be vaccinated? The timing, we understand that, that, that um, the testing may not be 100% bulletproof that individuals may get, um, may, may become infected over the weekend, for example. Um, although we require them to test by Friday. Um, but that's just, that, that's an issue that, that um, we're not gonna be able to 100% do away with that particular eventuality. There is going to be some timing issues. Um, the only way to prevent anybody from getting infected, quite frankly, is to remain remote the way we are. And I just don't think that in the long run, that is the best way uh, for Lacerda to go. And we have to have a presence in the office uh, in some way, shape or form. So hopefully that helps with, um, with your questions. So instituting this mandatory vaccination program is new information subsequent to the issuance of your memos. Yes, correct. Okay, did it default from uh, Chair Solis's um, emergency order? Um, it inf that informed it. Uh, that and the fact that there are other agencies that are moving towards that that uh, that model, and so yes, that was part of the the thinking that went into um, to um, our decision. Also, yeah. it, it it's really about providing member services and making sure that we um, get to that new normal quickly, as quickly as we possibly can, and as safely as we possibly can. Okay, there are programs out there that require twice a week testing. Um, which, which I think are an attempt to uh, address some of the issues that I mentioned. Yeah. So I would, I would encourage you to evaluate those. Okay. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I do not see any other trustees in the queue. Unless there are any last questions, we are moving on to item six, our CIO report. Mr. Grable. Good morning, uh, Chair Knox. Good morning, trustees. Calvin, if you could pull up the CIO report, that would be fantastic. Uh, so, and thank you, Calvin, for driving the slides today. Uh, if you can turn, Calvin, to slide nine, that would be appreciated. Uh, so I'll talk about um, the financial performance for the month of June, which is the last month of our fiscal year. Um, at the end of June, the fund was at $71.5 billion, which is another high watermark. The fund was up 1% net for the month and was up 25.2% for the fiscal year, which is about 210 basis points above our custom benchmark. And uh, I'll focus my comments today on 25.2% because that's worthy of a pause. In addition, uh, OPEB uh, returned 28.4% for the fiscal year, and that's also worthy of a pause. Both those numbers, 28.4 and 25.2, I would put in the category of generational numbers. I hope I'm wrong, uh, but that level of annual returns, you know, should not be anticipated with the U.S. Treasury at, you know, uh, 133 or so basis points. 
Uh, we have in this report some statistical analysis that, that details the statement about a generational type number. Uh, a couple interesting points to highlight. First is asset allocation matters. OPEB outperformed the pension because OPEB had more of what worked, equity, credit, and real assets, and less of what did not generate returns in the bull market, specifically investment grade bonds. Consistent with our investment beliefs, asset allocation is of paramount importance, yet implementation matters as well. And I'll detail that, Calvin, if you turn to the next slide. The two charts on the left detail the performance of the four functional categories of each plan. Uh, with the exception of real assets, the active nature of our implementation for the pension outperformed the passive nature of OPEB at the functional asset category level. Specifically, our active initiatives work. Private equity was our best performing category at about 50.6% for the fiscal year. Our newer investment models have been adding value. For example, illiquid credit was up 30.8% for the fiscal year. As we heard during the credit and risk uh, mitigation committee, hedge funds was up 16.6% with a 0.1 equity beta. And this is a, uh, a phenomenal number. Our private equity co-investment program was up about 63% for the fiscal year, recognizing that private assets lag by a quarter. We are, and, and that's an affirmative, executing on our allocator to investor strategic initiatives. We are optimizing our investment model, i.e. our private equity co-investment. We're strengthening our influence over fees. We have lower fee models um, as we see in a liquid credit. Um, and, we will go, and we're also enhancing our operational effectiveness. We'll go into more details about these initiatives during the offsite. We had broad participation across all asset categories. Our returns may be durable as that they, they did not just come from equities. The fund generated over 15% from global equity, private equity, high yield, bank loans, illiquid credit, natural resources, infrastructure, and hedge funds. We have a risk aware portfolio in that compared to our benchmark, we had relatively low volatility and a high sharp ratio. The one area, well, core and value added real estate continued to underperform during the fiscal year. And next month at the Real Asset Committee, uh, we are working with Stepstone to give a presentation to the committee about reimagining our real estate program. Next month, we'll also have uh, details in our quarterly performance book uh, about OPEB and the pension. Calvin, if you could turn to slide 16, please. So here we, we um, uh, changed the standard materials in the CIO report to put it in three slides that provide some context around 25.2%. So what this slide shows is using our previous strategic asset allocation and our most current capital market assumptions, uh, that, that's really how this um, is prepared, the annual returns for the total fund are estimated to be between 2.9% and 9.5%, 90% of the time. 25.2%, as you can see on the right side, is a positive outlier, a, a way positive outlier. And one way to think about that is that it's good cholesterol. Now we want to avoid the bad cholesterol on the left side and you know, the, those negative outliers do not feel as good and, and, and certainly impact uh, negatively our funded ratio. The takeaway from this slide is that we should not plan in this type of year. It, it's not expected and that increasing risk to be further in the right tail likely comes with uncompensated risks. We need to remain true to diversification and our investment beliefs. Calvin, if you could turn the page. This provides some additional context. This is a histogram of our fiscal year returns since 1990. Fiscal year 21 is clearly the best year. It's interesting to note that more than half the observations were from 11.4% to 21.3%. And in some ways that reflects the evolution of our portfolio. We've had a major tailwind. In June of 1990, the 10 year treasury yielded about eight and a half percent. The decline to about 1.3% has stimulated returns for a majority of this period. And during that, our asset allocation has shifted as we've embraced complexity. The next slide, which is the last one I'll comment on, 
uh, this is, and this is the last one about the fiscal year performance, this compares the annual return, of the total fund to that of a reference or 6040 portfolio since 1990. The total fund is in blue, the reference portfolio is in gray, and the takeaways are as follows. First, we've had few stretches with consistent total fund outperformance compared to that reference portfolio. However, that just looks at returns and not the quality of those returns or volatility. And it's good to know that fiscal year 21 did outperform. Our new strategic asset allocation is more diversified than ever. It should help us with downside protection, yet it should generate returns from more sources. We are more risk aware. And, and the one thing I'll note on the bottom is the two years since 1980 that did outperform this fiscal year were fiscal 83 when we did about 45% gross and fiscal 85 when the return was 31.3% gross. And with that, Mr. Chair, happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Grable. Um, I don't see anyone in the queue. Out, out of curiosity, what was uh, last year's return rate, 20? Fiscal year 20, I think was about 1% or so. Yeah, I recall it being positive, thank you. Excellent. Any questions from trustees on Mr. Grable's report? Seeing none, hearing none, thank you very much, Mr. Grable. We are on to item seven, consent items. We have one item before us. Any discussion before we call the roll? Okay, Linda. I need a motion. Oh, hello. Can I entertain a motion, please, for the uh, consent move. item? I'll move it. I'll move. Moved, I uh, heard Mr. Green, seconded by Ms. Sanchez. Please call the roll, Linda. Thank you, Mr. Green. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Greenwood. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, I vote no on this item. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez. Ms. Aye. Sanchez, thank you. Chair Knox? Aye. Thank you, the chair, the, the chair passes. The motion passes with one no. We are a well-oiled machine this morning, Linda. <laughs> Moving on to item eight, we have non-consent items. Under A, we have a recommendation that the board approve the adoption of the revised investments policy statement uh, dated August 4th, 2021. Mr. Perez, did you wanna walk us through this? Yeah, good morning, Chair Knox and trustees. As you mentioned, the next item on the agenda is an update to the investment policy statement, which I'll refer to as the IPS. Um, Calvin, if you please, will you move to slide three? Thank you. As you recall, a new strategic asset allocation was approved for the total fund in May. And now this is the last step in our strategic asset allocation process. And that is to update the IPS to reflect all these changes. So in your package today, you should have a cover memo, a short presentation, a red line version of the IPS, as well as a clean version. Also, since the IPS sets benchmarks for the fund, Makita's presentation from June's board meeting is also attached, as well as a presentation on allocation ranges. And then the last attachment includes a concurrence letter from Makita. I know this is a large packet, so thank you for going through. I'll go through at a high level the enhancements made to the IPS document. So Kelvin, if you could please move to the next slide. Thank you. So starting with the language, language in section C and D, which both cover the strategic asset allocation. We incorporate a new language to reflect the now approved asset allocation. This includes a fifth functional bucket for overlays and hedges, as well as establishing liquid credit. I think the chart there may say illiquid, but that is a type of what's liquid credit. We also updated the real estate groupings and included long-term bonds in the risk mitigation category, as Ms. Sanchez was asking a question to this morning in the committee. So moving to section H on ESG, the language reflects Lacera's ESG integration in the investment process, which is consistent with our recent work over the years. In section I concerning diversity and inclusion, the word equity was added to the title of the section and the description edited to harmonize cited diversity attributes with Lacera's policies and reflecting Lacera's board ratified TIED initiative. Finally, the appendices in the back were updated to reflect the new asset allocation including an interim step towards the final allocation, as well as the new benchmarks. Um, I do wanna mention again that the benchmarks in the table are consistent with the presentation that Makita delivered to the board 
at the June meeting. And lastly, the appendix on the chief investment officer's delegated authority was changed from text format to a table which groups authorities by type. The language is updated to reflect current policies and procedures, including board approved structure reviews and guidelines, and also harmonizes authority across all asset categories. All of these updates were done with input from the legal team as well as Makita. So Chair Knox and trustees, that concludes my comments. We can stand for questions or if needed, Scott Drazel and myself are prepared to go into more detail on the changes. And of course, Makita is also available to address any questions the trustees may have. Thank you, Mr. Perez. I do not see anyone in the chat box queue. I'd like to I'd thank like to, everyone like for their move. work and move the item, Bernstein. I'll thank second you. it. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein moves, seconded by Ms. Sanchez. Any other questions or comments? I had one question, um, Mr. Perez, on page, and I know we talked about this a while back. It's on page 25 where it talks about in the event the CIO is not available, um, Lacera will follow the board approved crisis response plan. I, I remember this coming up a while back where we were maybe too specific and, and what powers fell to what person. Can you remind me what led to this change? Um, led to the changes, we wanted some consistency across our business <laughs> continuity practices. So we decided, thought it would be well to put it, to follow the same procedures that are in the crisis plan. So there's a certain list of steps within that crisis plan that lists what would happen if Mr. Grable or CIO was not available. So it would be, for example, if Mr. Grable is not available, I may be wrong on this, but like off the top of my head, it would be you, Mr. Knox, a PIO and the CEO would get together to make a decision on what the next step should be if, if time would be needed. And it's outlined in the, in the crisis plan, but um, that, that was the thought behind including it in this, in this section. Perfect, thank you. Any other comments before we call the roll? Okay, Linda. Thank you, Mr. Green. Great job, Jude. Hi. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Hmm, was aye. Yeah, I got it. Ms. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Yes. Ms. Chair Knox? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item B is a recommendation that the board select Stepstone to provide private equity consulting services. A memo dated July 13, 2021. Mr. Wagner. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, before well, we start the presentation, I have a few comments. First, I want to thank the chairman of the equity committee, Mr. Santos and the CIO, John Grable, for participating in the interview phase of the consultant search. Each brought a very complimentary perspective to the process. Next, I want to thank the firms that responded with various mergers in the consulting industry since Lucera last did a private equity consultant search. It appears fewer firms today are willing to bid on this type of work, so we were happy that there was competition for the mandate. And lastly, regarding the finalists, both firms are top-notched as evidenced by the consulting work each has already done for Lucera. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Derek and Cheryl to provide more details on the recommendation. Derek? Great. Uh, Colin, slide eight, please. Uh, good morning, um, uh, uh, trustees. Chris, Cheryl, and myself were members of the evaluation team. In addition, Mr. Santos and Mr. Grable also participated in the semifinalist evaluation stage. Next slide, please. Lacera evaluated the consultants based on seven categories, which Lacera believes are the most important characteristics for a PE consultant. Next slide, please. The following slide shows the timeline for the PE consultant search process. Lacera evaluated the proposals from three firms in March through April. The evaluations were conducted on the consultant's PE team specifically, not teams from other asset classes. After the initial proposal review stage, Lacera moved to two firms to the same semi-final rounds in May and June, where Lacera conducted interviews and performed reference checks. Lacera scored the two finalists based on the data accumulated from the reference checks and the interviews to come up with the final recommendation. Next slide, please. For a large PE program like Lacera's that is growing in size and sophistication, especially with its recent expansion 
into co-investments and secondaries, Lacera is seeking for specific competencies in a private equity consultant. Slide 13, please. Lacera received three proposals from Alborn, Stepstone, and Wilshire and chose to advance Alborn and Stepstone to the interview stage. Next slide, please. Lacera's process resulted in Stepstone ranking number one and Alborn ranking number two. Next slide, please. Slide 15 shows the final scores that led to the rankings. These are based on the seven categories that were previously mentioned. We, knew, we note that these scores are for private equity consultant services and do not refer to the ability of Alborn or Stepstone to perform, to perform consulting services for Lucera's other asset classes. Next slide, please. Slide 16 shows the fee differential between Stepstone and Alborn. We note that while Al Stepstone's fees are higher than Alborn's, the fee is still competitive and lower than Lucera's current fee. Stepstone's proposed fee of $675,000 is a result of the mul a multi-contract discount. Uh, so Lucera also selected Stepstone to be its real estate consultant. Further, while both firms provide unique and commendable offerings that would benefit Lucera, Lucera believes Stepstone's offering is a better fit given the private equity program specific needs. For example, Stepstone will be able to directly assist Lucera by providing references to better diligence, co-invest, and secondary opportunities, the successful ex execution of which would save Lucera millions of dollars a year in reduced management fees. Next slide, please. Lucera notes both firms regard the promotion of diversity and inclusion as important and are active supporters of various organizations that promote diversity. We also note both firms are diverse. Stepstone is 51% diverse. While Alborn was prevented from <clears throat> disclosing specific diversity statistics due to EU law, staff went to Alborn's website and noted that 40% of their identified partners were female. With that, I will now turn the next section to Cheryl, who can provide more details on our recommendation. Cheryl. Thanks, Derek. And good morning, trustees. Um, if we can move on to slide 20, please. So as Derek mentioned earlier, the team evaluated the respondents based on certain desired competencies. And I will just touch on some of the ways that Stepstone meets or exceeds the competencies that we were looking for in the search. Stepstone has a substantial global footprint with investment professionals across 13 countries. Stepstone's database called SPY is robust and tracks well over 30,000 funds and 60,000 companies. That is a great value add for Lacera as we diligence primary funds as well as co-investments and secondaries. Regarding cybersecurity, we found that Stepstone has had no data breaches in the last 10 years and that they employ comprehensive <clears throat> cybersecurity measures to protect their data and has detailed disaster recovery and business continu continuity plans in place. Um, slide tw 22, please. So we've touched on some of these merits already in prior slides. I would just add that Stepstone was founded in 2007 by Monty Brem, Tom Keck, and Jose Fernandez as a private equity consulting specialist. Mr. Fernandez will be, Lacera's, uh, will be on Lacera's dedicated client team, and he has worked with Lacera for the past five years. The proposed Stepstone team for Lacera is a strong and diverse team that includes women and minorities. And the three main contacts will be Jose Fernandez, Natalie Walker, and Daniel Kokorian. Next slide, please. With respect to concerns, as you know, Stepstone became a publicly traded company last year, and we evaluated how that might negatively impact our relationship with Stepstone. We were able to gain comfort on this point, given that Stepstone is still majority owned by its partners and employees, and Stepstone professionals are expected to maintain control over the company and a majority of the board. The ability to issue equity interests also provides Stepstone with a means to retain and recruit talent. Our next concern was whether we can successfully manage conflicts given that Stepstone provides both discretionary and non-discretionary private equity investment services. And the discretionary side of the business does provide much of the firm's revenue. The evaluation team determined that <clears throat> these potential conflicts can be sufficiently mitigated. Regardless of the mandate, <clears throat> excuse me, Stepstone uses the same research team and the same research proce process to the diligence investments. So there should be no information discrepancy. Investment professionals work on both types of mandates and are not compensated based on which accounts they serve. Stepstone has provided both types of services since its inception, 
and Lassara has been able to successfully manage those conflicts in the past. The last concern we had was whether uh, was regarding Stepstone's higher fee, which Derek had already discussed earlier. In conclusion, we believe that Stepstone would be the best candidate to address the needs of Lassara's private equity program. And with that, we would be happy to stand for questions. Thank you very much. I have Mr. Kelly in the queue. Thank you. I had a question or questions on page, um, on slide number 17, firm diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so Stepstone, I didn't, I didn't reconcile this, but Stepstone operates worldwide and was able to respond to, uh, to a number of um, uh, questions here regarding uh, diversity, equity, inclusion policies, but Alborn didn't, um, citing, um, this vague uh, reason of um, they're constrained by many different employment laws around around the world. Um, what am what am I missing there? Anything? It just seemed to to be a significant disconnect between how one firm is interpreting such laws and another firm. I'll answer that, uh, Derek. Uh, Mr. Kelly, this is Chris. Uh, Alborn is a UK uh, uh, domiciled company, and they're required to follow the UK laws. And Stepstone is the United States, so they can provide that information. So that's really the difference. Okay, and you, but you disclose the um, the importance of this uh, uh, of these efforts in the in the RFP itself, correct? Oh yes. Okay, and then my other comment was there's a, a line item here that says um, demographics of investment team and firm management, as reported, percentage of people identifying as LGBTQ plus, um, and it says not surveyed. Do they have an intention to survey? Uh I don't, I don't know that answer, but, but we can get back to you with an answer. Uh, uh, I'm interested in that. There was, there was, there was an odd um, press report recently from, I think it was CalPERS that, um, that uh, they were having a discussion about diversity uh, 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 or diverse candidates who were applying to be CIO. And there was discussion that, that they only considered race and gender, that they didn't consider LGBTQ uh, status. And this seemed to shock some board members as to why or trustees as to why LGBTQ is a is, is a characteristic that warrants um, uh, uh, evaluation. So um, I would I would ask that um, if they don't survey uh, on an ongoing basis, if they don't survey LGBTQ, that they provide uh, some explanation uh, regarding whether or not they do intend to survey. Just because you don't do it currently doesn't mean you can't. And I get that I get that not everyone who's LGBT, LGBTQ would self-identify as such. But that also, then once you have that data, you can begin to have a larger conversation about how comfortable or uncomfortable they are in the firm from, from being themselves. Uh, thank you very much. I thought the presentation was very good. Thank you. I vote approval. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I have a uh, motion from Mr. Santos, second from Ms. Sanchez. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Linda, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Santos? Aye. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Ms. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Yes. Chair Knox? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item C, recommendation that the board approve attendance of trustees at the 2021 Super Return, Super Return North America, October 4th and 5th. And I'll approve the reimbursement item. of all travel all costs, people not waiting for the chair. <laughs> Mr. Kelly moves, Ms. Sanchez uh, seconds in the interest of time. Please call I the apologize. roll. apologize. <laughs> Mr. Green? I'd like to keep the finish, please. <laughs> trustee uh, education and trustee travel policy. <laughs> thank you. Um, Aye. Thank you. Mr. Santos? Aye. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Ms. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Chair Knox? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Non-consent D, recommendation that the board approve the proposed general consultant search minimum qualifications, evaluation criteria, and scope of work. Memo dated July 19th, 2021. Mr. Perez. Good morning again, Chair Knox and trustees. As you mentioned, the next item is a recommendation to proceed with a general consultant search. Um, for background, per the investment-related procurement policy, consultants will be retained for five years with the availability to extend their contract for two more years. 
So Makita was hired in January of 2016. So this past January marked the five year period. At the end of, at the June 2020 board meeting, it was communicated to the board that Makita's contract would be extended as we did not want to begin a search process as we went through the strategic asset allocation study. So as this process is coming to an end, we are recommending to launch a search for a general consultant. So with that background, I'd like to hand it over to Tara Elijah and Magdalia Armstrong. But before I do, I'd like to mention that Magdalia is one of our newer team members on our global equity team. And I do believe this is her first presentation to the board. So with that, Tara, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jude. Good morning, uh, Chair and trustees. Today, we're recommending approval of the minimum qualifications, evaluation criteria, and scope of work that have been provided. As Jude mentioned, our current general consultant, Makita, had a five-year contract. The last search process for general consultant was conducted in 2015 and finalized in 2016 with an initial expiration earlier this year. Moving on to slide three, it lists the proposed evaluation team that consists of members representing various asset classes, as well as members from portfolio analytics. Chair Knox, at your discretion and selection, uh, trustees will be involved in the evaluation process. This being the general consultant search, uh, the senior team of the investment office will be involved as needed throughout the process. The evaluation of consultants will follow the standard RFP two-phase process, and then final recommendation will be brought before the board for its selection authority. The next slide shows the proposed timeline of the overall search, which begins with board approval, followed by a planned launch of the RFP within Q3 of this year. Next, uh, the timeline flows into the two evaluation phases, shown in red and green. Both phases are set to be completed late this year into Q1 of 2022. And lastly, shown in blue, we plan to present a final recommendation by the second quarter of 2022. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Magdalia Armstrong. Thank you. Thanks, Tara, um, and good morning. Uh, Chair Knox and trustees. Um, so when looking over the minimum qualifications, uh, you will see that they are largely consistent with the prior consultant searches. Uh, these are the key areas that will aim to provide Lacera with not only experienced firms, uh, but also provide Lacera with firms who have depth and breadth and resources so, they, so that they are equipped uh, and able to advise to large and complex pensions such as Lucera. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, these are the eight categories we will evaluate firms on and not seven, as the slide says on the top. Uh, these are the key topics uh, to allow us to assess each individual consulting firm. I'll highlight ESG uh, as it has been incorporated here to assess the capacity and quality of consultants ESG expertise. Uh, as you heard earlier um, regarding the investment policy statement, uh, ESG is being elevated um, as it has been and continues to be integrated into our due diligence process. So again, we're looking to assess firms expertise in this space. And lastly, uh, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this slide provides a summary of the scope of work. Uh, these are the services we expect the consultant firm to perform. Uh, we added more detail in attachment two, which gives us the opportunity uh, to establish our expectations across the various topics from asset liability studies and down to uh, collaboration with the board, staff, and specialist consultants that Lucera works with. This ends our prepared remarks and I'll pause here for any questions. Thank you for the remarks from the team, including our first time presenter, Ms. Elijah. They didn't interrupt you like they did me, so you're off to a good start. I have Mr. Kelly, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I have Mr. Rice that wanted to make a quick comment before we get into the trustee questions. 
Um, yes. Um, now that we're through with just the the presentation of the uh, of the of the PowerPoint and into discussion, uh, for the sake of avoiding any uh, appearance of of impropriety, the the uh, Makita team should be put into the uh, the waiting room. Excellent point. Why don't we pause for thirty seconds? Linda, can you let us know when that's done? Absolutely. Just one second. Thank you for that, Mr. Rice. Okay, I have moved Tim Phila and Stephen McCourt to the waiting room. I don't see any other Makita consultants on this call. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. So I had a question on slide uh, number six. Um, so Makita has, uh, Makita regularly invites trustees to participate in or watch uh, on, a, on a subsequent basis. Um, some some um, some presentations they do. They do a you know a quarterly market summary. They recently uh, did a two part series on cryptocurrency, which I'm in the first. I'm watching the first part. So there's a there's an ability for uh, the general consultant to make available to trustees. It's kind of education or a research um, uh, portfolio, if you will, and and and. And I think that's something we should require. Where would that fit in here in one through eight if it, if it, if it isn't already in one through eight? And if it is, where is that? So um, I'll take that question. Um, so part four, so Mr. Knox and Trustee Kelly. So part four is where that would be, would be investment and market research capabilities. In the larger scope of work attached, I do believe there's a section that they do have to provide education when asked for. And I, that's where that would fall in the category. And the team is currently drafting the RFP with the built out questions. So we could take this feedback and, and include that in a question into the RFP before it is launched, Mr. Kelly. Perfect. I think that's really informative uh, uh, for, for uh, trustees to have that ability if they want to avail themselves of it. Thank you very much. I thought the presentation was great. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Kelly. Any other questions, comments? I'll entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Move. Moved by Mr. Santos, seconded by Mr. Kelly. No further questions. Uh, Linda, please call the roll. Okay, uh, Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Kiha? Aye. Ms. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Chair Knox? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item E, recommendation that the board review the board teleconference meeting policy and provide input as to or approve changes. We have a memo dated August 2nd, 2021. Mr. Rice, did you wanna kick this off? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Knox and trustees. Uh, for the past 17 months, uh, we've been allowed to have virtual meetings such as this one without regard to the Brown Act uh, teleconference uh, formalities because of an executive order that was issued by Governor Newsom. Uh, the governor has announced that this order relaxing the Brown Act teleconference requirements will expire at the end of September. Therefore, starting with the October meetings, we'll be back in a world where we must comply with <coughs> the, uh, all the Brown Act formalities including the, the teleconference rules. Uh, in uh, 2019, uh, the board adopted a teleconference meeting policy. It provides for uh, teleconference to be used only on a very limited basis, uh, only three circumstances. They're described in the, in the memo that you have. Uh, and, and so there's really a fairly high bar to having a, a teleconference meeting uh, apps, uh, it, it, once we're back under the current policy. Uh, therefore, a few trustees on the board had requested that we bring the teleconference policy back to the board 
for review. And in the memo you have before you, uh, I've suggested for your consideration um, four areas of possible uh, change that would relax the requirement and make it much more, uh, much easier for uh, the chair, um, uh, the director of HR, the CEO, uh, and individual trustees, in fact, um, to uh, invoke um, uh, and, and receive uh, teleconference meetings uh, going forward. While that doesn't excuse, won't excuse the requirements of the Brown Act for teleconference meetings, uh, because the board cannot change by policy uh, the Brown Act, it nevertheless will relax the circumstances when teleconference meetings that can be held and therefore may be of assistance as we uh, continue through the hopefully the final stages of the uh, pandemic and also look forward to the possibility of other health and safety emergencies in the future and have a policy that's more realistic um, for such circumstances. It is possible that either through legislation or by executive order of the uh, of the governor that the rules may continue to be relaxed past September 30th, but we can't predict that right now. Our legislative team uh, and legal teams are monitoring um, those development and there are local government advocacy groups that are that are working um, to possibly um, extend um, the, the governor's order, but uh, it's, it's a discretionary act and it's unknown whether that'll happen. Um, so with that, I'm happy to open uh, it up for uh, questions and discussion. If there is a request for changes, the suggestion would be that I would take those changes, whether they be in my memo or uh, ideas that the trustees bring forward today and, and, and come back in September with a red line for final approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Before we get into the uh, questions from trustees, did, did you have in light of the potential for the extension of the executive order from the governor, a suggested um, option of the four that would give us the most flexibility in this interim COVID period <laughs> as, a, as opposed to a long-term yeah, I would actually suggest that we that that all four of them they're they're not mutually exclusive. They really are all separate points. Um, for example, uh, the the uh, the uh, the opening of the teleconference policy to committees, whereas right now the teleconference policy does not cover committees. The uh, just the uh, um, recognition of of a continuing state of emergency if one was to be declared, or uh, for health or safety reasons, uh, things like that. All four of them really. I think are worthy of, of consideration for uh, together for uh, inclusion in a revised policy. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Rice. I have Mr. Kelly in the queue. Thank you. So Stephen, under the revised policy, um, if we were to have a teleconference meeting, do the uh, individual places in which trustee and trust where trustees will be need to be open to any and all Lucera members? Yes, because that's a requirement of the Brown Act. And, and unless there's an extension, we'll be back in under the Brown Act rules. So um, uh, if, if any of you would have a meeting in your home, the agenda would have to be posted there. Uh, you would have to allow members of the public into wherever you are, and they would have to have the opportunity and the ability to hear the meeting and participate uh, in the meeting, for example, through public comment, all of which are Brown Act comments. One way we can mitigate um, that, and it is expressly permitted by the Brown Act, is that LaSara can have a separate um, a public teleconference location, which could be in the boardroom, it could be in our workshop room on the first floor, it could be somewhere else where members of the public, it would be agendized that members of the public could go. That would not excuse the, the, the need to open up the individual locations where all of the trustees are, um, but it might mitigate um, uh, um, the issue. One other issue that's related to this is that unlike now, where the requirement for a quorum in LA County is not in force, uh, after September 30th. You're froze. You're frozen. Mr. Rice is frozen. Mr. Rice is frozen. Yeah. Come back, Mr. Rice, come back. <laughs> I believe what he was gonna say is that um, the, um, having five individuals or five trustees within LA County will be enforced after September 30th. Okay. 
I had some other questions for him. Um, Mr. Rice looks like he's moving now, at least. Um, sorry, I, I had a, a, apparently an internet issue. I, I don't know how much of my answer to Mr. Kelly's question was, was heard. You were about think, to say something about uh, September 30th. Uh, yeah, a, so, so the answer to your um, question, um, Trustee Kelly, is that yes, all the trustees homes or other locations where they are um, would need to be open to the public. One way that, that we can mitigate that issue, uh, and it's especially permitted by the Brown Act, is to have an agendized public teleconference location, whether it be our boardroom or, um, or uh, the first floor work, work room or some other location where the public can go. That would not excuse the, 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 the compliance at each of your individual okay. locations, but it might uh, mitigate the issue. Uh, okay. There was one other uh, comment and each that of, I wanted. And each of those locations has to be then ADA compliant, and we also have to allow for translators. Well, uh, we, we don't provide for translators right now. That's a discretionary, uh, that's mentioned in the policy, the, the uh, uh, Daimele Elatory Act, uh, which is not mandatory. It, it, it provides an option uh, and the board has not exercised that yet. I think we're gonna be dealing with that as we go into the um, videotaping of, and, and archiving of the meetings. That's something that's, that we've been talking about in, in that context. But the, yes, it would have to be accessible to the public uh, and uh, which means that yes, the, the, the ADA requirements would apply in terms of somebody getting into uh, wherever you are. Okay, so in the policy, at least in your summary memo, you state that a trustee can invoke this policy within five business days of a meeting, um, but invoke it in compliance with the Brown Act. Yes, and that and and uh, I, it wasn't mentioned in that particular um, item, paragraph three in the memo, but uh, in other items of, in the list of four, it's it's stated that the meeting will be under the act, and 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 we actually it does say that in 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 paragraph three. So all uh, everything we do will be un, in under the teleconference policy will be under the act. That being okay, the, then, the Brown okay, Act. Then, then I'm not supportive of of. Um, individual trustees being allowed to invoke um, a teleconference meeting if I have to make my home open to the public uh, and make it accessible. Is that, is that how, it, I, I, I think I was generally confused by what we're voting on because if we're voting on compliance with the Brown Act, fine, but then we don't need to vote on that because we're subject to laws. And, but I don't, if, I guess my question is if I support this, Am I supporting the provi a provision that would allow me or force me to make my home open to the public in the event we have a teleconference meeting? Um, yes, uh, and a, 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 although you are not required to have to to sit in your home and have it a, 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 after after September 30th, you can come into La Serra, you can right. go somewhere else. But uh, I may be I may be I may be ill. I may have my own health condition that that does not allow me to attend the meeting. Now yes, I would just not attend the meeting. I wouldn't call for the meeting to be held by a teleconference so that I then have to open my home to the public. You would still have the option of not attending the meeting. Uh, if you did want to attend the meeting and you wanted to attend it at home, your home would have to be open. That's just the, we, we can't change that. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question or. Please, I have, I have Mr. Oh. Santos in the queue though. First, Ms. Sanchez, I, let me uh, pick him up because he was in the chat queue. I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I believe that this is, this recommendations are reasonable. Uh, the Board of Retirement adopted these recommendations. Um, I will move uh, to direct staff to uh, rewrite the um, teleconference uh, policy reflecting the changes suggested here. Uh, just a, thank you. As a general comment is that no, no one has the authority to override the state or federal law. We don't have the authority. So whatever we do, we have to do it on the, on the, the law. So this changes that are being proposed here has to be and will be under the Brown Act. We cannot change anything. So I, I hear that many of us are uncomfortable 
uh, with open up our homes, but we certainly, in, in my case, I can certainly do that out of, out of my office or some other public place if I choose to avail myself of this as someone that is adopted. Uh, so it's strictly up to me how I'm going to handle that um, under the law. And um, so that's why I'm in favor of this uh, recommendation. And Mr. Santos, so I'm clear, it sounded like you made a motion there. Yes. And was that to include items one through four, all of yes. the four options? And then it sounded like Mr. Kehoe, did you second or did you want to? Uh, I, I second it. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion by Mr. Santos, seconded by Mr. Kehoe. I have Ms. Sanchez in the queue. And anyone else that wants to address the item, please uh, let me know. Ms. Sanchez? Mr. Santos said everything I was going to say. Excellent. Mr. Bernstein. Um, just in, in past years, uh, I have been involved in agendizing teleconferencing requests from trustees on the Board of Retirement. And we were never obligated to uh, prove ADA compliance. It never came up. I would just ask if this item uh, is approved and when staff returns it, if you could clarify that. I do not believe individual locations need to be ADA compliant under the current regulations. The Brown Act requires that the, that the uh, teleconference location be accessible to the public. Uh, opened, uh, so I, I, you and I have done this in the past, Mr. Rice, and, and there was never a specific question that I recall being asked about demonstrating ADA compliance, which is a different standard than general accessibility. I, I, I'm just asking that it be clarified. Well, I will do that. Mr. Kelly has another thank question. You. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So under the under this revised policy, all attendees, even if they're attending from their home, all trustees who are attending from their home or, or, or another location, that location needs to be within Los Angeles County. It can't be in Peru or, or Beijing. No, what, what, what needs to happen is that we need to uh, confirm that a quorum of the trustees are present in LA County. Not all the trustees, a quorum. Okay, so if I decide to fly to Beijing for a conference, I can then invoke alone, I can invoke under this policy, the requirement to hold a teleconference meeting, knowing I'm in Beijing, and that's gonna require all other trustees who are in Los Angeles County, or at least a quorum to make their homes open to the public. No, because it's only the, the, the agendizing, if everybody else wanted to be in the boardroom and you just invoked it for uh, uh, yourself, then it would be only as okay. to you. Okay, so I flee the country in order to avoid making my home open. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to ch check. I believe that as long as the quorum's in LA County, other trustees can be anywhere. And in fact, I think that's happened with international locations in the, in the past. Yes, Ms. Sanchez is... is um, is raising and I was payment. asked to make it ADA, uh, to make sure it was ADA uh, compliant, and, and we by did. the way. Yes, and we did. Um, oh, so uh, so in, in any event, um, thank you for the comments. I do not have anyone else in the queue. We have a motion and a second. Linda, could you please call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Mr. Green? Aye. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Ms. Greenwood? Aye. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Yes. Chair Knox? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Just time check. I was planning on going through the reports. I had not received any um, requests to hold anything and then do the staff review and go to the order before we took a break. Just uh, looking around the boxes, make sure everybody's okay with that. So we are on to item nine reports. A items A through G are information only. Do we have any requests to pull any of those items for discussion? Seeing yeah. none, hearing none. We are item uh, 10 now, items for staff review. Linda, do we have any items for staff review? We do not. Thank you very much. Good of the order. I am going to mix things up a little bit today and go out of order on good of the order. Mr. Rice, did you want to kick things off for us? Um, yes. Um, thank you, Chair Knox and, and trustees. 
uh, I appreciate the opportunity to take a minute to uh, inform the the board and others listening of a, of a change in our uh, legal team, uh, our in-house legal team. Uh, I'd like to recognize senior staff counsel Johanna Fontenot, who is retiring at the end of August after 30 years of service. Uh, 15 of those years were with Lacerra and the other 15 were with county council. Johanna is an excellent lawyer and has made many contributions to Lacerra during her time here. She served as lead counsel for the Human uh, Resources Division, which is a very important assignment. She's also handled many litigation and claims issues and policy matters, not only on HR matters, but across Lacerra's business, including investment and transactional issues, benefits, uh, and uh, organizational governance. Above all, aside from her legal skills and judgment, uh, Johanna is a person of integrity. Uh, she's known and respected at the county, in county council's office, in the broader legal community, uh, in Los Angeles and, and beyond, and among other public pension systems and her standing outside of La Serra has frequently benefited the fund. Johanna has been a trusted leader and a positive presence among our team in the legal division and throughout La Serra. She served as interim chief counsel while I was out of the uh, office uh, earlier this year. We in the legal division will miss Johanna and I certainly will feel the loss personally since I have looked frequently to collaborate with her on many matters. It's been a privilege and pleasure to have had the opportunity to work with Johanna. The legal division and I congratulate her and thank her uh, and wish her the very best in her well-deserved retirement. I don't think Johanna was, is at this meeting as a participant, but I know she's listening on the live stream. She will be uh, here in person uh, at tomorrow's board of uh, retirement meeting. Uh, but again, I thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about uh, Johanna as she uh, ends her, her Lacerra career. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Linda, did you want to call on everyone else, please? Yes, I will start off with Mr. Green. I will echo Mr. Rice's comments on Joanna and all the wonderful work that she's done these last several years at Lucera. Just want to say how much we appreciate her and wish her well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Thank you, Linda. Um, I will reserve my comments on Johanna for the Puerto Rican meeting, which is at. Um, present. Um, I mentioned uh, the Board of Retirement uh, uh, last week about a particular uh, friend of mine, a Republican friend who refused to take the vaccine because uh, it was not FDA approved. Uh, subsequently, he was infected uh, with COVID-19 and that uh, being hospitalized and um, pretty much begged to get experimental drugs that they were offered uh, to him. One of them it was a cost of $5,000 that his insurance would not cover because it's not a FDA, FDA approved. Um, that particular medication did not work. So he uh, had no choice but to get into uh, another experimental drug that, that uh, he became part of the study. And, and the question was, will he be in the placebo group or he will be in the uh, medication group? And he was lucky enough to be in the medication group and that experimental testing uh, medication did work for him. He was released uh, from the hospital and he's home now recovering. It's a long recovery because of uh, the impact of COVID on his body is, we don't know how long it's gonna take, but it appears it's gonna take months. Um, was really happy to hear that he was uh, home. I uh, called him up and I asked him if he was ready when medical uh, proved to take the vaccine. And uh, shockingly to me, he says, no way that he would take the vaccine. Um, I asked him, I said, well, what's the difference when you take experimental drugs? He says, I'm not going to take the vaccine. So anyway, I just wanted to say that because as some of the people in my communities, that's how they feel. While I respect, you know, their decision, I think those decisions will impact me and other people in the community because if they get infected, they potentially can infect others. 
but nevertheless, that's that's reality in our communities today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greenwood. Um, thank you very much. I am glad that we are all here, healthy, safe, uh, and just want to thank staff for putting on a wonderful meeting and um, thank our legal staff for the hard work that they are doing and the hard work that they continue to do for us. And congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. Mr. Jones? Um, I don't have anything. Thank you. Mr. Bernstein? I have no comments. Thank you. Ms. Sanchez? Ms. Sanchez, okay, I don't see her. Um, Mr. Grable? Mr. Kelly? Yes, uh, first congratulations. Oh, I'm so, 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 I'm so sorry, John. I skipped Mr. Kelly, I'll come right back to you. And so then sorry. after Mr. Kelly, if we could circle back to back Mr. To, Jones real yeah. quickly, Linda. So sorry, Mr. Kelly, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to um, acknowledge Joanna's service, not only to La Sierra, but to the county. Um, as a whole. I think she's a phenomenal lawyer. Um, I think she counseled us very, very well. Um, and I don't say this about many people, but I always got a great level of comfort by seeing her in the room. And to me, that says a lot. Um, so I wish her all the best in her retirement. She's deserved it. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge two other groups since I was talking earlier about public servants. One group is our healthcare workers um, who continue every day all, all across this country to um, care the best they can for people with um, COVID-19. And so many of them who are becoming frustrated and demoralized because of the ongoing um, infections. Um, they continue to do it every day. And I think they're just miracle workers. And the second are uh, firefighters and public safety personnel, particularly in this state, who again, they've seen it, they've seen it all before, but they go back every day to continue to fight fires. Many of them whom are separated from their families and friends for long periods of time. I think they're absolutely phenomenal. And I wanted to acknowledge the work of both groups today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jones, we'll come back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, actually have one comment just as it related to the, um, uh, as, as, as a, I guess I can no longer call myself new to the board uh, as much anymore, but I just know since I've been here, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of energy uh, and comment from the Crenshaw uh, community and I'm just um, uh, I'm I'm proud to say you know the the as I've tried to delve into it and as we've discussed it I think the spirit of um, what we've tried to do around equity inclusion and all those things counts through everything that we do including a topic as passionate as many as the public commenters are on and I hope we don't uh, I hope there's still yet um, additional capacity uh, within the board and within the staff at times to make sure we don't shy away from opportunities to be even better and engage more uh, and, and engage more wisely in terms of how we communicate uh, with those who may be looking to us to um, um, to be advocates for things that they're passionate about as well. So I just wanted to both give ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back, but at the same time say there's there's perhaps some additional capacity in things that we have as a board and as an organization to do even better. Thank you. Um, now back to Mr. Grable. Thank you, Linda. First, Johanna, congratulations. Uh, all your colleagues in the investment office will certainly miss you and we're all jealous at the same time. And we'll be working really hard to make sure that your benefit payments show up you know, every month. Uh, Second thing I'd like to mention is we've had some news uh, in our global equity team. First, um, and I, I sent a note to the board on this, that uh, Ted Wright, the principal investment officer for global equities, was appointed uh, to be the chief investment officer uh, for the state of Connecticut treasurer's office. Uh, congratulations, Ted. Fantastic opportunity. I don't know if you're listening, but we all you know, wish you much uh, success and skill in that endeavor. Uh, in the interim, 
Uh, she's not with us right now, but uh, I've asked um, Esmeralda Del Bosque to serve in an interim capacity as the principal investment officer for global equity. I, I think that um, Esme will do a fantastic job. Uh, she is someone who challenges me, someone you know, from whom I learn every single day, and I'm really excited you know, to see Esme uh, in this role. And the third thing I'll mention with our global equity team is Jeff Ja. Uh, I learned last night that Jeff just passed level three of the CFA exam. It's a big undertaking to pass all three levels of the CFA. Congratulations, Jeff. Um, you know, uh, we all benefit once again from having you as a colleague. So congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Grable. Next, I'll call on Mr. Kreiman. Yes, I just wanted to, um, to congratulate Johanna on her, her pending retirement. I truly appreciate all of the hard work and um, your assistance when, when Mr. Rice was, um, was away. Um, so just wanted to wish you good health and um, a long retirement. Thank you, um, Mr. Lugo. Not sure if he's on. Um, next, we will call on um, Mr. McCourt. Great. Uh, thanks, Linda. I just wanted to acknowledge that 25% return years don't happen every year or decade or maybe even every several decades. Uh, and uh, uh, to say the least, um, would like to give a virtual pat on the back to both staff and the board for uh, not just the outcome, which was uh, extraordinarily strong, um, but also being able to operate at a very high level during um, this continued pandemic. Um, so uh, managing a defined benefit plan is not a destination, it's a journey. Uh, there's no victory laps, but um, it's been great to see the operation as efficient and um, strong uh, as it has been over the last year. Nice work, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Filla? I sure. have nothing further to add. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Ms. Stardox. Thank you. I would echo uh, Mr. McCord's comments. Want to thank staff and, and, and John in particular just for all your efforts. Um, it's a fantastic result. Um, Joanna, we're certainly going to miss you. You were of great assistance to me um, while Stephen was out of the office and I pulsed you uh, a few times and sometimes real time just to make sure we were on the right track. So I, I appreciate your due diligence and, and your service to Lucera. Um, last thing I was going to mention, I completed the uh, audit certification program through Harvard University for audit committees. Um, really excellent. I, I want to thank Ms. Sanchez for uh, cluing me into that. And with that, I think we are ready for a 10 minute break before executive session. And then Linda, when we come back, you can make sure we have all the right folks in the room. Sounds good. Thank you.